Hi, I'm Karim Nakani, professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, co-director of the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard, and co-founder of the Harvard Business School Digital Initiative. I'll be talking about my new book, Competing in the Age of AI, which argues that the ways in which we run our enterprises, the ways in which we run our organizations and our companies is being changed radically because of artificial intelligence. We'll be talking about how AI changes both your business model and your operating model. I hope you can join me. Thank you. Tell us about your recent published book, Competing in the Age of AI. Uh, so my new book, uh, Competing in the Age of AI, uh, co-authored with my friend and colleague here at Harvard Business School, really tries to uh, make sense of the ways in which the world is changing because AI has become so, uh, so prevalent in our lives. Most of us have smartphones and these smartphones and all the services that we might use for music, for photos, for social media, for content consumption are now being powered through AI systems. And we don't actually think about that. We just take those services for granted, but underneath it all are widely deployed AI systems that, are, that have been developed to make predictions, to do pattern recognition, and to drive automation. And this change, this change of, the, of us, all of us in the age of AI means that how we run our businesses, how we run our enterprises are going to be radically affected. And this book tries to lay out what the main questions are, right? And provide lots of examples on issues that executives and managers and technical leaders need to resolve as all of us get pulled into uh, competing in the age of AI. In your book, there is a mention of Kuala Lumpur. Could you yes. share or elaborate on that, on how is it looking for KL in the future? So I've had the good fortune to visit uh, KL several times over the last few years. Uh, it's one of my favorite cities to visit. Um, and um, I've been doing, um, you know, a range of Harvard Business School executive education uh, in cooperation with the CADs uh, on analytics. And one of the moments uh, that I describe in the book is an epiphany I had when uh, I was uh, in Jalana Lohr, uh, the big restaurant uh, street, very delicious yummy food. I really miss it a lot. Um, and you know, there's lots of Chinese tourists there. Um, and I noticed that there was a, there was a performer, a singer, uh, who was singing for the Chinese tourists. Um, and she was disabled, but she had a microphone and she was in a wheelchair. She was going around all over the street singing Chinese songs on request. But the thing that caught my eye was that she was not taking cash payments. She was taking payments on Alipay or WePay through QR codes. And that just blew my mind because right there in itself was the, the, the beginnings of the fact that AI and AI driven systems were becoming very prevalent. I had the same experience when I went to the Petronas Towers uh, and went to the 7-Eleven. I was, you know, I just arrived, I was jet lagged, I was hungry, I wanted some, you know, uh, good junk food. So I went to the 7-Eleven there uh, and uh, there too, I tried to offer my visa card for payment. They said, no, no visa, you have to go to the ATM down the mall or we'll take and financial Alipay. And the fact that both the, a, a leading global brand like 7-Eleven is not taking Visa, it's taking and financial Alipay, and also your street performers also taking um, uh, Alipay, tells you that the world is changing. And Alipay is a, is a system that is completely powered by AI, right? The, the company and financial which runs Alipay has 1.2 billion users, but only 10,000 employees. So imagine 10,000 employees serving 1.2 billion users. All of that is being enabled through AI. So my experience, of course, in KL was this, uh, this epiphany around and financial uh, and Alipay and how widespread it was. But then in our interactions with executives in Malaysia uh, who had come to our, our workshops, I discovered that there's a ton of talent inside of Malaysian businesses that actually understand what's needed to become AI first. And we hope that that becomes the, the model 
for Malaysian companies as well to adopt AI, to think about automation in very interesting ways and try to rethink their business architecture along the way. How can we advance the AI field in Malaysia? My belief is that the AI field in Malaysia can be advanced actually quite easily. Um, when, when we first think about AI, a lot of us get caught up in thinking about AI in terms of science fiction. For example, we think about Star Wars and Star Trek or all these movies that show sort of sentient machines doing their own thing. That is still far away uh, in the science fiction world. Today, what's working is what we call weak AI, which is one algorithm doing one narrow task and doing it really well. And again, those tasks can be related to some kind of a prediction, some kind of a pattern recognition, or some kind of automation. And the AI giants today, like the and financials, the Baidu's, the ten cents of the world, or the Microsofts, the Facebooks, the Googles of the world, the Amazons of the world, take those algorithms and deploy them at scale. So they take weak AI and they deploy them at scale. So in order for businesses to become good at this, they need to actually do two things. They need to build up their technical infrastructure. And it's both the infrastructure in terms of the technology, but also the human capital. They need to have people that are well-versed in statistics, in systems, and in machine learning. Now, this is not so that they become data scientists. You will need data scientists as well. But we need business executives that understand the technical stack. But they also then understand what you can do with this technical stack from a digital strategy perspective, from a data-driven marketing perspective, from an operations perspective, from a leadership perspective, and from a people perspective. So it's this melding of understanding what the technology can do and this application, which I think is needed, especially around the top ranks of businesses in Malaysia. We still need to actually invest in our technical talent. Actually, Malaysia has a very good infrastructure for engineering and STEM and technology. All of the, that, those talents can, in fact, be retrained to be able to be AI ready. And I think that's a great opportunity for all of Malaysia. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, share something, right? Karim and I got your book before it was a real book. <laughs> uh, yes. And um, I, I thought when I read that, it was, I, I told you, I felt that I couldn't read it fast enough. Um, and to be honest, I got it first uh, when you first did it. Was it last year before summer? Right? Last year. Yeah. 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 And, and I summer. also told you, I'm so selfish. I didn't want you to publish it because yes. we were, we were, we, I could literally take things from the book and start implementing within our own company. And we're not big MNCs. Like you said, the structure, um, you know, the technical, but me being the business owner, being, being savvy about what that's needed to be done. Now, two things I kind of failed to see then, which I am applying now, is the fifth point that you talk about in your book about the governance. Yes. You know, you know we, we are so small and I'm going like, you know, oh, governance, really, this, is, this has to be for the, for the Amazons of the world. Yeah. Uh, and today we, are, we, are, we have um, put in lawyers to yeah. look at the, you know, policies of governance within the company. And we are not, we are not you know, Amazon big. So yeah. it, it's a, you know, like I'm going like that small point, I, I went like the fifth point that can wait. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't wait anymore. And yeah. having done that, you know, post COVID, and I have to thank you that, um, we managed to get the product and the platform and we haven't integrated the, the whole AI solution yet. But we were, we were fortunately ready and we could, we could pack in the revenue that took us a whole year last year we managed to peg it in the last two months. Wow, and um, I, I, I've got to thank you and I've got to thank Dennis. Uh, I, think, I think it changed the way, I, I didn't feel I was too small to start applying it. Although the fact that you're talking about the second point that I want to bring that all my data scientists were going like, that's not enough data to make it AI. And I think that's the misconception that you're just addressing now. Yes. That you need to automate stuff and you don't need like gazillion, like 1.2 billion worth of people. No, after that, that. No, we, can, we can learn from the giants, but the giants didn't start at 1.2 billion. They started with two, three, four, or five. But also, I think, that, I think you're making a very important point, which is the time to start is now, right? What you need to do is basically figure out what are the use cases that will drive customer value right? And then figure out how you can then deploy AI systems for that. Even very basic machine learning systems that are mostly off the shelf, 
right? You can get it on open source software, you know, uh, you know, uh, Alibaba is in a cloud will give it to you. Microsoft cloud will give it to you. Google cloud will give it to you. Amazon cloud will give it to you. All those guys will give you lots of off the shelf AI algorithms already. What's required is to sort of think about what use case is going to drive customer value through AI and then, you know, learn to develop it, pilot it, and then actually implement and scale. I mean, I think that's the journey that executives need to be on, right? And not to be intimidated by it or not to let their data scientists say, well, you know, it's gonna take us three years and 1.2 billion users for us to get anywhere. That's not the case. Yeah. Nelly, am I allowed to ask some questions? Sure, why not? Okay, Karim, um, a lot of them freak out when you talk about AI and automation because of job loss, yeah. correct? 10,000 uh, employees, um, you know, um, servicing 1.2 billion people, but you also have 100,000 employees of these 10 yeah. million people, but job loss is, is real with, with yeah. post-COVID. Uh, how do you, um, how would you address that? For, for me, it's not a job loss, it's about optimizing uh, the workforce, correct? Nobody needs to work 12 hours doing mundane stuff. But how yes. would you, you the AI guru, would be able to address that in, in a manner that people don't freak out? <laughs> yes. Well, I think I think it's okay to freak out because we should freak out. Um, again, the numbers from and financial tell you what is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so banks in Malaysia should pay attention, right? Banks all over Southeast Asia should pay attention to the fact that, by the way, you know, and financial is here, right? Mm -hmm. It's in it's in KL. Uh, it's in uh, it's in Jakarta. It, it is all over uh, uh, the uh, the economy already. Uh, so the way I think about this is, um, and I actually learned this from uh, Peter Domingos, who's a computer science professor uh, at uh, University of Washington. What he said is that, you know, um, uh, uh, algorithms won't replace people, but people with algorithms will replace people without algorithms. Mm -hmm. right? And I sort of, I always keep saying that, right? So, so you know, AI is not going to replace managers. AI is not going to replace executives. But executives and managers with AI are going to replace executives and managers without AI. And my my asterisk after that is we'll probably need fewer of those people, right? We won't need as many managers. We won't need as many executives to get the same kind of leverage uh, that we get today. So that has consequences for us. I mean, there's there's significant national policy question, which is like, should we all go to a four day work week? Should we all, you know, be doing less mundane tasks? You know, big, big questions. We went from seven days a week to five days a week. Well, maybe we should go to four days a week, right? That's part of the conversation that we should be thinking about. Uh, will there be need for transition? Of course, there's gonna be lots of need for transition and we need, we need support. We need social support, both from a corporate perspective, but also from a, from a governmental perspective for all the dislocations that will happen. But in many ways, this is inevitable. This is sort of the, the Schumpeterian creative destruction we see in the economy where our consumers don't care about, you know, if you're profitable or not profitable, the consumers want the best service at the lowest price. And that's, that's, the, that's the thing that we have to adjust to and figure out. And so what I often say is that, you know, um, my hope is that as, as and this is, by the way, is not just a shock in Southeast Asia. This is a global shock. It's in China, it's in the US, it's in Latin America, it's in Europe, right? It's everywhere. Uh, it's in India, it's everywhere. Um, and I think, I think the, 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 the question for all of us is gonna be, is what is the social contract we now make with our governments and with our organizations, with our companies around work, around meaningfulness of work? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we actually then then put these 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 things together? For example, there's been some proposals that we should be taxing robots, right? If robots are doing work, then yeah. maybe they should be paying taxes, right? It's interesting right now. You, you know, robots are thought of as a capital expenditure. So uh, in the U.S., if you make a capital expenditure, you sale on taxes. Yeah. Well, maybe right. The model should be that I don't know that the sort of the, the fine detail of economics of it. I'm not making a case for robots being taxed or not. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying that 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 those are the types of questions we'll all need to be in to figure things out. Like basic, uh, what universal basic income, correct? I mean, people are talking about. There's a whole. By the way, already in COVID, at least at least in the U.S., we've had universal basic income. Right, yeah. uh, and in Europe as well. I don't know what's happening in Southeast Asia, but 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 it's just, so. I think I think we're all sort of grappling with these massive changes in front of us, uh, and trying to deal with them.
what are the most critical changes uh, that we must make to face the future effectively? So I would think that the major changes that we need to make as companies, uh, as executives of companies, as leaders of organizations, as um, uh, as government leaders, uh, relates to what I call the three T's. Uh, there is the technology part, which is investment in technology. I think I think we don't want to shy away from it. We want to actually embrace it. But investment doesn't actually have to be that much because what's happened is that the cost of this technology has dropped radically. So as we think about this, it is thinking strategically about where you deploy this technology, but committing to deploy the technology and actually making it happen. The second T is actually training. We need to train and retrain our workers and our executives, both at the executive ranks, at the business ranks, you know, doing both again, the, the technical stack of machine learning, statistics, systems, but also business transformation. So training matters at the business level, but also, at the, at the technical level, right? We need to make sure that our technologists, our IT specialists, our data scientists, and so on and so forth are in fact up to snuff and up to, up to global standards. So technology, training, and the last thing is transformation. And in fact, I think this is probably the biggest one. You know, we understand the technology. There's no rocket science in the technology of AI. We know how to do training. We can do training at scale. We do that at Harvard all the time. There's lots of great ways to drive training. But transformation requires guts. Techno transformation requires courage. Transformation requires leadership. And this is where I think uh, the executives really need to take the bull by the horns and really drive the transformation message. You will have to change the architecture of your company. You will have to change your operating model. You will have to change your business model. It's inevitable. Right? And so you have to just figure out how are you going to make that happen and how are you going to enable your organization to do this. So again, technology, training, and transformation as the big three things that we need to be thinking about in this age of AI. I, I like that point because you have now put a stop for, you know, the mythical word, word that AI wouldn't work without a lot of data. Yeah. Like everybody goes like, you know, maybe Nelly will touch base on that later. China is great because they have so much of data and nobody else can do AI because, you know, privacy laws and all that. And, and the skills, I was going to ask that, that, you know, is it data or is it the skills that's going to be the huge um, stopper for a company or anybody trying to engage into this journey? Yeah, I think that's a great question, um, Shah. Uh, look, I think all companies have data. The data might be dirty, might be, might be crappy. Uh, and we often say garbage in, garbage out. And the, the way to start thinking about it is that across your enterprise, there is a data stream being produced. It may not be being captured effectively. It may be actually sitting on spreadsheets, might be sitting uh, on, on, in paper, but that's where you need to make the investment in capturing the data from your operation, from your transactions that your company operates in. So people, again, get caught up in this mythical view that I need billions of users and billions, like, no. Again, those companies show us what's possible, but to start, they didn't start there, they started very low. And the same thing for all of us, right? We start with what we have, but we need to invest in the data acquisition and consolidation of the data and putting it together. And so I think that that is like, you know, I would say don't hire the data scientists first, hire the data engineers that will actually get your data uh, done first, right? Get that done first. And then the training is, you know, look, I think the training is widely available. You, again, we have to invest in the training of our staff, right? Uh, there are lots of great courses offered in Malaysia, lots of great courses offered globally, lots of great courses offered online. In fact, because of COVID, everybody's moved online. So, uh, so take advantage of that uh, and train your staff to go do these things. So I think they go both hand in hand. I don't think it's one or the other. How has the AI field changed in the past five years? And what do you predict will happen in the next five years, global as well as in Malaysia? So from my perspective, the biggest change in the AI field has been sort of this advent of deep learning systems, um, which are really basically statistics on steroids uh, done to help us uh, predict uh, some future state, do, do massive scale pattern recognition on anything. 
Um, and again, if you sort of think about what AI systems do, they do prediction, they do pattern recognition, they do auto process automation, right? Those three abstract things happen in all companies, right? We're always sitting there thinking about, you know, what should I, what should the price be of something? What should the inventory be of something? Should I hire somebody? Should I fire somebody? You know, will a customer leave or not? Will there be fraud in this transaction? Will there be a machine that will break down? Those are all predictions. These are predictions that people make all the time, right? And now AI comes in and can does that oftentimes much more accurately, much more consistently. Same thing with pattern recognition, right? There's a lot of things we do in business, which is about recognizing patterns, about consumer behavior, right? Competitor behavior and so on and so forth. Again, AI is very good at pattern recognition. And then of course we have processes and AI can help drive process automation. So deep learning has helped tremendously in this way. But what's been also great is that all of the advancements have not been proprietary actually. All those advancements have been open sourced. So the entire computer science world has made all of these advances available for free. And so our ability to take this stuff and deploy it has increased massively. And that's been the very interesting thing where in fact, you know, the top companies, the top organizations, the top universities around the world have released all of this as open source. And then we can take, all of us can take advantage of it and make it happen. What I see happening in the future, um, and this builds on the conversation that um, the Shah built, is how we think about data and privacy and governance. You know, how we think about fairness. Uh, for example, um, you know, if we sort of think about fairness and statistics, you know, do you want to be fair on average, right? Or do you want to be fair to each person, right? Being fair on average is very different than being fair to each individual. So how we build our algorithms so that they are privacy aware, so that they have their fairness uh, is built right in, uh, so that we sort of eliminate bias. Um, all, those, all those things actually, I think are gonna be the next stage of where AI is gonna get developed. Of course, there will be technical advances where we can do more and more and more cool things. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things around GPT-3 and sort of automated, you know, text generation and so forth. That's all happening. But I think for the world of business, for the world of organizations, the next big uh, thing, you know, beyond the training, beyond the transformation, beyond the technology is going to be how do we bring in the governance side? How do we bring in the fairness side? How do we bring in the bias side, the privacy side from day one? Um, and I think that's where a lot of work is going to get done. Yeah, the, the abuse that could come with that is what you've got to be conscious about from now on. Yeah. Exactly. Just as we can scale benefits to 1.2 billion people, yeah, we can also scale the bias and abuse to 1.2 billion people, right? And so I think that both of those things come together. The fourth industrial revolution and AI, how ready are we globally? My sense about the fourth industrial revolution in AI is that there is a digital divide amongst companies. Um, and the term digital divide was coined in the US when it was about access to computers between the well-off and the not so well-off. A similar digital divide is occurring between companies. There's a set of companies that have built the sensor systems, built the systems, built the, the data infrastructure to take advantage of all the IoT systems, the blockchain and AI, and are doing amazingly well. Then there's a whole bunch of companies that are struggling. So we actually see this digital divide happen where a bunch of companies are accelerating and a bunch of companies are decelerating. And that's the biggest worry you would have because then the ones that are decelerating are gonna be shedding jobs, shedding profits, right? And then these guys may keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and again, I think it goes back to, uh, you know, this is not, again, this is not a new news. Like our book, right, uh, is, 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 is trying to, create a consolidated framework around what's happening in the world of business. But it's not new news and there's, there's, no, there's no magic secret sauce. It's really good management, good executive leadership to get those companies to change, get those companies to transform. You think about a company like Netflix and how many times it has transformed. You think of a company like Microsoft and how many times it has transformed. You think about a company like Amazon and you think about how, how those companies have transformed. It can be done, giant companies can transform. Right. 
uh, SMEs can also transform, right? But you have to believe it and you have to do it. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Of course it's uncomfortable. Is it going to be risky? Of course it's going to be risky, right? But that's why you guys get paid the big bucks, right? To drive that kind of change. And I think that's up to you. Would you would you agree that um, you know you call about you, you know it's interesting to talk about this digital divide. Um, the weak will not survive, and oh, yeah. that's okay. Should they should they be protected? Why? <laughs> right? Why, so, why, yeah. why should I as a consumer have to pay for some bad management in a company? Exactly. Yeah, it's like dinosaur, right? If citizens, you do, citizens, you citizens yeah. should not be subsidizing bad managers, bad owners. Get rid of them and enable new companies to come up. Yes, come on. Yeah. Anything else you want to add, Shah? No, I'm, I'm, I'm with him on that. Correct. I mean, of course, uh, Karim, you also talk about uh, monopoly laws and. Yeah, you know, no. I, look, we yeah. have, we have to, we have to balance. Absolutely, right. We exactly. Actually, it's like you a know, forest, right? You have to sort of kill the dead trees, enable the new trees to show up, but also make sure the big trees aren't getting too big, either. Absolutely. You know, you're absolutely right. When I lived in Sweden, when, when they were talking about Monopoly or Microsoft and all that, I, I coming from an Asian background, I go like, if someone does it really well, why do you have to stop them? <laughs> you know, and, and I see it now, I mean, 10 years pass forward, that to strike that balance is, is needed. And I think that's part of becoming an, uh, an advanced nation and looking yes. at it in, in fairness. Like you said, how do you look at things in fairness? So, yeah. And who are we optimizing for? Are we optimizing for consumers? Are we optimizing for bad gov bad companies? Are we, are, you know, that, that's the, those are the questions to ask. And you, you should call a spade a spade, right? The weaker companies that fail to invest, that fail to return to money to shareholders, right? Are mistreating their employees. And yet somehow we're gonna actually enable them to still succeed. You know, to add on to that, I think a lot of government uh, in, in ASEAN have pointed out post COVID that companies that government linked uh, corporations who do not embrace uh, Industry 4.0 will be left behind and they will not be bailed out. And that was a, I thought that was a very strong statement to make and that was fantastic to hear that, you know, mm -hmm. government yeah. telling that, you know, you got to, you got to ship it out or you're going to leave it behind. Yeah. Yeah. Would China be the AI superpower? China already is an AI superpower. I mean, I think what China has shown is that companies that, that invest in AI, that invest in data, that invest in platforms do amazingly well. So there's no question in my mind that China is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a dominant AI superpower. And what they've gotten really good at is implementation and scaling. They have become, their companies and their organizations need to build what we call AI factories inside of their organizations. We argue in our book that the AI factory is now gonna be at the core of most operations, right? And Chinese companies, the large ones certainly, have become good at building those factories and scaling them across a whole range of enterprises. So I think from an implementation point of view, especially from a B2C point of view, China is well ahead. Um, the US actually has an advantage, of course, in terms of research, we have our own giants, uh, and, but we're more on the B2B side. We're not as sophisticated on the B2C side as the Chinese are. Uh, and I think that's gonna be a very interesting um, uh, development as we move forward. What practical advice do you have for teams just getting started? Well, the first thing they should read my book. The advice I have is like, read my book. I, I, I will a million percent support that. Uh, <laughs> as much as I want to protect my business, but it's so important. Yes, so, and so I think, I, think, I think we've tried in this book really to demystify AI and business, help you think about the, all the use cases that may be possible, but also how to go about making that change. Um, and so, so what I uh, uh, suggest, of course, is get educated. Our book, there's plenty of other books that you can be reading uh, about this. Take some courses, of course, as well. Um, but then what I would sort of say is for teams inside of companies, be laser focused on customer value. Think about the use cases that will deliver customer value and then really create a system where you can rapidly prototype and test, rapidly prototype and test customer value through AI, right? Don't wait for AI systems that are gonna take nine months, year, 18 months to come through, force your technical teams, force your teams 
to give you a prototype in three months, max four months. And the prototype doesn't have to be amazing. It has to show proof of concept. It has to show that it works. And once it works, figure out a way to implement and to scale and get better. And so I think most teams get stuck in the Nirvana world, like somewhere we'll get there and AI is gonna shower rainbows on us and it's gonna be amazing. That's just magical thinking, right? This is all about hand-to-hand -hand combat and, and making sure that you focus on customer value and use the customer value perspective to help you think about the use cases and then the data you need and the algorithms you will build and then deliver that value. And fo be, be focused on that. Don't, I mean, we still need the big product strategy, the transformation story and so forth. That all matters. But in the end, this, this era is gonna be won one by one on algorithms you develop and the customer value you can create from those algorithms. So Karim, in order to do that, you need the talent and and when when in a in a in um in a region where where this although we have a lot of young uh people in in this part of the region you know 50 percent of us are you know 35 years and below um those kind of skills we are not really there yet so so i, 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 disagree. Assuming... I disagree i i disagree with you like okay founders of google were like you know 20s founders of facebook were in their 20s right, right? Founders of, of, of Amazon were in their thirties. So I, I disagree with that. I think there's, there's wisdom in the gray hair for sure. I agree, <laughs> but there's also, there's also ambition, vision, courage, and going for things. And that's what young people have. And yeah. we need to unleash our young people to go after these things, enable them to do these, do these things, right? To be creative. Again, this is what China did. China learned from America. They saw their companies. Bill Gates was the poster child of success that everybody went after. And we need to unleash our young people to go do it. I mean, I think, you know, like, like the, read the book for wisdom, but we need <laughs> energy, we need ambition, we need vision, we need people to go out there and make a difference. And I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And we as old people, gray beards, need to get out of their way to enable them to do that. Karim, I, I don't like this we. Who are these we we're talking about? I thought, I thought you... I, <laughs> no, sorry, you're, 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 you're young. I'm sorry. You're very young, yes, of course. Yes. Well, I, I think it's um, on. I think we need to hear that because we, we tend to... Uh, we tend to short... Um, What's the word, right? We, we change, yeah. No, we're yeah, short changing yeah. our youth Short's and our youth. energy. Yes, absolutely. Why do you need? No, you don't. You know, Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard. Yeah. Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's. I I just think that that we, as countries, as societies, of course, there's wisdom. Of course, there's things, but we need to also enable opportunity for our young folks, uh, and and make that happen. Very essential. Uh, what made you decide to tackle the subject and how did you get into the AI field and why did you stay? Uh, so I have um, been, for whatever reason, uh, and I, it's hard for me to sort of go back and rationalize why I made the choices I did, but I've always been interested at the intersection of technology and business. Uh, you know, both, uh, you know, my undergraduate was in electrical engineering and management. Uh, when I worked for four years at General Electric, it was in sales, marketing, new product development around MRIs and GE healthcare, medical systems, medical imaging systems. Um, you know, I did my master's degree in technology and policy. Uh, you know, when I worked at Boston Consulting Group, I was again at the intersection of, you know, the internet boom and how businesses adopt internet. Uh, and then when I was at uh, um, doing my PhD, I was also doing technology management as my PhD topic. So I've always been at the intersection of technology and business. Um, and uh, the thing I started to notice, uh, you know, I first got interested in, you know, open source software and why people were collaborating so well without a large organization guiding their way, um, I started to discover the power of mobilization, the power of, uh, of people collaborating together around the world. Uh, and that was just something that was just so refreshing to see because we always thought that you need a top-down command and control system to get work done, but this was like a bottoms-up process. And that journey took me into a whole world of things. Look, again, at the intersection of technology and business, right? Um, uh, and, and, and in fact, community as well, where communities were creating technologies that were having an impact on business. 
And so this, this was the journey. And, um, you know, in the 20, 2009 and 10, I started working with uh, the Space Administration at, at, in the US, NASA. Um, and we started to say, could we get communities of people to solve the toughest NASA technical problems? And in fact, we, we saw that we could, we could run contests and the toughest problems were being solved by people from around the world. But that's where we saw the inkling of the start of AI solutions emerging, the machine learning solutions emerging. Often those solutions were cheaper, better, faster than what NASA had, than our other partners like Harvard Medical School or the Broad Institute had as well. And so that, that, um, uh, uh, that became the most exciting thing for us. Um, and then that sparked my interest in thinking through how, uh, how businesses uh, can adopt AI. 